Thank you for the warm introduction. Um, it's lovely to be here. I, uh, I went to Yale for my PhD. I finished four years ago. Um, and I, before I introduce our panel, let me just say how gratifying it is to be back in a moment of resurgent labor militancy on campus. I was an organizer and a member and an elected officer in United Here Local 33 for my years here. And it's very exciting to return in a moment when uh, that union is once again on the move. So. Um, <laughs> And I think pertinent to our discussion today. Uh, so I will introduce the panel and then I'll have some discussion questions and we'll just get right into it. Um, so uh, going in order down here, um, I think probably many of us know our sort of uh, celebrity guest today. Um, but Sarah Nelson is uh, one of the most dynamic and militant um, national level union leaders in the country. Uh, she played a key role as we, you know, we discussed some yesterday for those who were here in uh, the bringing to a halt the government shutdown several years ago and uh, has been leading the way in the labor movement in general in a kind of more uh, militant and uh, whole worker oriented organizing uh, path and tra tra trajectory. So it's very exciting to have her with us here today. She is the president of the Association of Flight Attendants CWA. Uh, next is Charles Dew. Uh, Charles is a labor lawyer currently employed at SEIU 32BJ, New York's Building Services Union. Previously, he worked for Local 1199 New England, based right around here, and Local, excuse me, uh, Local 11 of Unite Here in Los Angeles. Uh, who's next? Uh, <laughs> Eric Blanc is an incoming assistant professor of labor studies at Rutgers University. He is the author of the forthcoming book, Do-It-Yourself Unionism, and the co-founder of the Emergency Workplace Organizing Committee, which I hope we can talk a little bit more about today. Uh, and finally, Lorena Lopez uh, is an organizing director in Local 11, also uh, Local 11 Unite here in Los Angeles. Uh, she, she started as a retail worker at LAX and became involved in labor activism during the Los, Los Angeles living wage campaign. Uh, so thank you to everyone for being here. It's a pleasure to be here with you all, and I'm really looking forward to our discussions today. Um, I imagine we'll cover some of the same, same themes as yesterday and get into deeper deeper kind of uh, discussion on some topics, and we'll also hopefully break some new ground. So to pick up a thread from yesterday, uh, and since we are here in the law school, I wanted to first talk about labor law. We often talk about labor law being broken. Uh, I think this is a, quite a commonplace now in the labor movement and in the labor law world. But what it means to say that it's broken, I think, could be a number of different things. And so I'm curious to hear from each of your perspectives, in what ways? Do you think labor law is broken or to put it more directly even what are the hardest and most severe legal problems faced right now by uh, <laughs> okay uh so uh the biggest problem is that there are very little to no consequences for companies when they break labor law um, or it takes a long time to get results and working people who are often organizing because they can't afford uh, to live under the conditions that uh, of the pay and benefits that they're receiving in their job um, or have very serious safety issues on the job, they can't afford to wait for those remedies. And so it is effectively denying workers their rights when there is any delay in any kind of consequences for companies interfering with that. And uh, we certainly also experience this under the Railway Labor Act as well. Um, there is no consequence until you get to the end of an election. So you, if workers have to actually file for an election with at least 50% support, not just 30, like under the NLRA, uh, have to get through the election, then file interference charges, and usually wait through a long process of uh, assessing whether or not the company actually violated or interfered with their rights in order to get any kind of remedy. And then hopefully it's a remedy that actually gives something to the workers, um, like a, a card check then uh, for recognition. Um, and, and that so rarely happens. The other issue is that under the Railway Labor Act, the oldest labor law in the country, uh, workers have a basically unfettered right to strike. Uh, but through the bureaucratic, uh, bureaucratic process of the government, that right has been slowly taken away uh, because there is uh, the government has taken an interest in preserving interstate commerce over workers' rights and not given workers the rights to release to be released into a strike. Um, 
contracts become amendable, they do not expire. So there is no major deadline there for anyone. And the government has effectively taken away that right to strike. Um, so I think that uh, these are some of the problems under the law. And the only way to fix those things is for workers to have enough consciousness, to have enough power to take mass action and uh, strike for recognition, uh, re regain their right to strike and um, simply take that, which may not be considered legal strikes under the law, um, but successful strikes because they're done in mass solidarity. Yeah, I think another problem is um what we're seeing with you know, the new organizing campaigns with Amazon and Starbucks, let's say, where after you win an election, it's still very difficult to get to a first contract. And the law doesn't really provide for any mechanisms to, to solve that problem. Um, right now, employers can just, all, their only obligation is to bargain in good faith. Um, but management side attorneys, you know, they've perfected the playbook on just going right up to that line of what good faith means and just doing that for years sometimes. And, you know, when you have bargaining that drags on for years, especially in an industry with a lot of turnover, that's, you know, that's, that's a huge problem. Um, and so many times you win an election, you don't reach your first contract. Uh, it can be incredibly demoralizing. It's not impossible to win it, but I think it is a barrier to achieving the type of scale in victories that we need to achieve. Um, and I think the framework of the law, like theoretically, uh, you know, the leverage for unions to get that contract is through economic action, through striking. Um, but also on that front, over the years, the doctrine, you know, through case law, but also through you know reforms to the, to the NLRA, um, has made it so really the most effective forms of economic action are unprotected. So you can't do a partial strike, you can't do intermittent strikes, uh, you can't do slowdowns. Um, so it's kind of like the most effective things are the things you can't do. So you, you put those things together and it's very difficult to get to a first contract. And you know, I think without something like first contract arbitration um, or just some other mechanism to, to get that win, um, it's, it's very difficult. Um, yeah, and so I, I agree with Sarah and Charles. I think the main point is the absence of penalties for breaking the law. And so that's not a minor thing. And I just want to, give an illustration of what that looks like in the Starbucks campaign. So uh, you might have heard there's been over 100 firings, well over 100 firings of worker organizers over the past year. And not just that, but uh, Schultz, the CEO of Starbucks, instituted something that's blatantly against the law, which is to deny benefits uh, to union stores. And not just that, doubled down, did it again, even after the NLRB uh, declared that it was illegal. And so what you see then, if you look at the graph of union filings, right, so unions that are uh, going to go to a vote in the election, it plateaus almost immediately after you have the mass firings, and in particular, after the denial of benefits. And so right now, when you talk to Starbucks workers, there's a lot of enthusiasm, but what they say is, you know, it's really hard. It's much harder to have the conversations when we're trying to get new stores because they say, yeah, we want to unionize, but look, you know, if we do that right now, we will be denied these benefits. Mm -hmm. And so I personally think that, you know, Howard Schultz, what he's doing right now is should be a national scandal. Mm -hmm. And frankly, like he should be put in jail if he keeps on breaking the law. This is, it's that level of uh, denial of basic democratic rights. And I think it's really incumbent on the labor movement as a whole to make it more of a scandal than it is. It's in some ways it's been so bad for so long that people just accept it. And what's exciting about this moment is a lot of people aren't accepting it. We need to put that as far as we can go. Um, I agree. I mean, it's uh, the lack of remedy, um, the low process, and the risk that workers think to take to organize the union. It's far uh, greater than than uh, the penalties the corporations will pay at the end of this long process, long complicated process with no remedy. Um, um, it is it's something that I know. Um, when we organize, uh, we we use the law, but we use it not as the way to win the union. We use the law as a part of many other uh, elements in organizing. If workers rely on the lab labor law as is today, we will not be able to organize uh, workers. Um, so it's just a small tactic, uh, but it's not how we win campaigns. 
Great. So following up on that, uh, you know, in labor history, when we talk about the formation of the current labor law regime in the 1930s, there are lots of arguments that we have about what caused what to happen exactly. But I think everyone would agree in some form that workers' action uh, in the workplace contributed to the changing legislative and legal environment, um, the wave of strike activity between 1934 and 1937, um, in, which, in the middle of which came the National Labor Relations Act. Uh, so I'm curious where you would point today in thinking about how workers' actions can or already have generated forms of political pressure and in particular also legal pressure and also alongside that, how to think about the role of illegal action. If, if I may, I mean, uh, um, in LA, I think uh, uh, um, in addition to using the law as, as, as just a, a, a small tactic, not, not the plan to win, um, we, we are using the law to, uh, to, to create new policy, um, to, um, to create more work, uh, regulation. Um, um, I organized, uh, I started organizing back in 2000, right after uh, 2000, we went public um, in, in, in non-union um, uh, hotel. Uh, this is, you know, housekeepers, dishwashers, from, um, um, uh, majority of immigrant workers. Uh, September 11 happened, hotels closed down. Um, we knew that those workers were never gonna come back especially those workers that fought for the union prior to September 11, they will never gonna come back. Uh, we um, uh, decided to pass uh, ordinance, local ordinance through the city council to require hotels to bring back everyone that was laid off due to September 11. Uh, we put the burden of proof on the companies. We didn't want the workers to show my employer did not call me back. We wanted the employer to show they recalled everyone back after September 11. And we and we won. Um, the pandemic happened. We knew the thousands of workers in LA were organized in the union um, in various cities uh, uh, in California, various cities, parts of LA. We decided to do the same thing. We passed local ordinance. This is what uh, this is what workers did during the pandemic. Mobilize phone calls, uh, zooming uh, their city council members asking to pass an ordinance that was created and written by our lawyers um, in the union uh, to make to ensure that every worker was going to be recalled after the pandemic. Uh, we were successful in various cities of Long Beach, Santa Monica, um, LA, West Hollywood. Uh, we, this, we knew that the same thing, uh, the same um, uh, uh, challenge um, was going to be, you know, workers were going to face throughout California. We decided to take it statewide and we won. Um, just to give you an example of how that, um, you know, um, um, just a few months ago, um, the deal we found, um, uh, Non-union campaign, Terranea, 500 workers, biggest employer in the city of Rancho Palos Verdes, laid off workers, laid off the worker leaders that were organized in the union. A year went by, they were not recalled. Uh, those workers, uh, through the organizing effort, uh, filed a complaint under the DLSC. Uh, the DLSC um, 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 took the complaint very seriously and fined the company um, or um, I think they had estimated about three point some five million dollars um, after about, um, at the first settlement conversations. They were required to uh, retroactively pay workers that were not recalled immediately after the hotels reopened a um, uh, million and a half dollars. It was life changing for workers that all this time had been laid off um, in, 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 in and had lost hope. Um, um, so I, I just want to share how uh, um, when we use the law to, uh, you know, uh, uh, to to create new policy, um, it's when it can be effective. Yeah, I agree with that. And I would say in response to the question of illegal action, 
the biggest strikes that we've seen in the recent years are still the 2018 teacher strikes, which in red states, which were overwhelmingly illegal and, and they won. And so there's a proof of concept there that even when the law says that you can't do something, sometimes the law becomes a relationship of forces. That being said, to me, the most surprising and interesting thing about the past year of unionization is the extent to which workers, often very militant workers, are attempting to use the NLRB process and making it more real than it has been. And that is a really, actually a surprising development. I think if you had asked most people a year ago, they would not have expected uh, it to take this form. A lot of people wrote this process off. And so what you see is um, almost the idealization in some ways of what the law allows has emboldened workers. And that's good. You have Starbucks and Amazon workers literally reading the NLRA in the shop on their breaks and they're showing, I don't know if anyone else has read the NLRA recently and they're giving it to coworkers and saying, look, have you read section 7A? You know, this is amazing. They're talking about section 7A and, and it's emboldening them to take action. And it's actually similar to the 30s in this sense that the myth of the law, which actually is less protected than a lot of the workers think, in turn becomes a fact on the ground when workers believe it to be true, take action and then impose it. And that is the dynamic. And that's actually why the union busting right now is so potentially detrimental because if the sense that there is a legally protected right to unionize the strike gets taken away, then that momentum can get cut away very quickly. Yeah, I, I love what you said about the way that the idea of the law really affects the way that organizing happens on the ground. And and I think about that, I mean, as you know, as a labor lawyer and and you know, I think there's people in this audience who maybe future labor lawyers, like I always think about how how to play that role of, you know, of of helping workers to grasp their own power and to feel protected and to feel that they can take the action. Because ultimately it's not like Lorena is saying, it's not the law that's going to, you know, organize all the workplaces, right? But having that sense of feeling protected can help people take that action. And um you know, and I think another thing on this question, like labor law reform that's related to is um, as more and more workers are organizing the workplaces and, you know, using the law and also running into the limits of the law and experiencing um, sometimes how ineffective it can be. I think that creates like more attention and just more awareness of the need for labor law reform. I mean, we've been trying to get federal labor law reform for decades and you know, failed every single time. Um, there's a lot of important innovation happening at the local level. Um, you know, I think we need to do a lot around the wage laws around, you know, in New York City, we passed just cause for fast food workers. You know, these are sort of ways to, um, to create more favorable conditions, not just, you know, substantively for workers, but also uh, for organizing. Um, but on the federal, you know, federal aspects, I think we, we, we're going to need to see more and more Amazon or more and more Starbucks in order to generate Absolutely. Um, it, the four Ds of union busting divide, delay, distract, and demoralize. Um, these can be turned on their head against the company as well. So sometimes what we have done is we have used the law in order to frame up what the company is doing that's wrong. Um, what Eric was describing about workers in the workplace actually reading the law and saying, hey, wait, the, 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 our rights are right here. It, it was no small thing, actually. He, it, it came a little late, but it was no small thing that President Biden put out a message uh, to the workers at uh, Bessemer, Alabama, and to all the workers across the country saying that it wasn't just the job of the, in government, of the government to enforce workers' rights, but to encourage unions. Um, and that is really important. So sometimes what we will do is we will use the law as a means to define what the company is doing as wrong. And that's really important for workers to have that kind of uh, moral standing when they're taking on their company. They, they, they feel a kind of backing there. And so we flip that on its head. And, and while the, the company will use the law sometimes to delay results in order to demoralize workers and get them to back away from taking a stand, what you can also do is that while that there is that delay in the outcome in the courts, which frankly are most of the times gonna go against the workers, that's what we see, 
During that whole time, you can use that as a bludgeon on the company to to bang on them, beat them up, shame them, and get a result. And <laughs> there goes the name tag. And um, and usually and usually get a settlement if you can uh, build enough power around uh, that shame. And what Eric is saying, I, I don't want to get lost here. Uh, I think everyone needs to take ownership going out of this building today uh, to make it your personal mission to shame Howard Schultz and tell everyone who's not taking action to also take action on shaming Howard Schultz and encouraging our government to put him in jail if he doesn't stop what he's doing. Um, but we can't, workers, when they take the agenda, can turn union busting on his head and use it against the companies and um, really bludgeon them to get results. Uh, I'm using very violent language. I <laughs> yeah, yeah, violent enough to knock your name away. <laughs> um, you know, I do think that actually um, thinking about the kind of more conflictual and, you know, the elements of friction that arise through the organizing process is, is important and something we should actually talk more about because, you know, unity is central, obviously, to organizing. Uh, but anyone who's ever done it knows that you do have to fight with people you love and are on the same side as, as well as people who you are not on the same side as. So I think that's uh, worth discussing more. And it related maybe to the next question I want to ask. Um, which is about organizational form. Every moment of uh, rapid labor movement advance, what we often call upsurges, has involved some kinds of innovation in how we build our organizations at all different kinds of scales, right? At the shop level, how you form your organizing committees at the shop level, um, all the way up to you know, national federations. And um, you know, the distinction between craft and industrial unionism arises in a, in a kind of, in that 1930s moment, in, you know, in such a kind of moment of organizational innovation. So I'm curious about um, the shapes and types of organizations that workers have built and maybe need to build in the coming years, um, who they bring together and who they might bring together in what new ways, uh, and where, if anywhere, we would look to see possibilities for these kinds of organizational innovations that might bring workers together in new or partly new kinds of configurations. Um, and this question seems to me to intersect with labor law pretty directly also in terms of, you know, the question of how bargaining units are defined, the question of um, unions are organized also by the federal government. So at any level of, of organizational form, I'm curious sort of what you think has happened, what you think will happen, what you think needs to happen. I can jump in to start on this one. Um, to me, one of the interesting dynamics that's new is the extent to which basically digital tools have facilitated worker to worker organizing. And so the back end for the Starbucks campaign is workers all the way across the country can help train workers uh, directly over Zoom on what they are going through and what they should expect. Similarly with Amazon, they were able to raise over $100,000 for the Amazon labor union because they had these viral TikTok videos that people then give donations to the GoFundMe and that paid for the shirts and the things that they needed on the ground. Uh, I'll just speak to my personal experience, which was uh, helping found the Emergency Workplace Organizing Committee, or EWOC, at the beginning of the pandemic. Essentially came out of the Bernie campaign using the distributed organizing tools to tap volunteers across the country. We took that infrastructure and put it towards new worker organizing so that any worker in the country right now, fill out two seconds to fill out a form online, and you'll have an organizer a volunteer organizer call you back within 72 hours and help you organize at work. And what's important about this is the reality is a lot of workers don't even know where to start, right? It's a very opaque process to get involved in organizing your workplace. And what we need to be saying as a labor movement is everybody needs a union. Everyone deserves a union. And you all, anybody out there can do this. Everybody can organize a union. And so EWOC and other processes like this are a way to try to use some of the new tools we have to inspire workers, but also just to give them the really basic uh, guidance and support that they need. And in some ways, it's not that hard organizing. It's not, it's not as, it doesn't require as much previous expertise as people think, but it requires a lot of work and dedication. And the role of organizers is to help give that support. And so I think that the forms of worker to worker organizing in this variety, um, you know, some of these are through unions. Starbucks is backed by SCIU, Amazon Labor Union is independent. To me, what cuts across all of these is the use of digital tools to facilitate uh, workers taking even more of a lead than they had in the past. And I think the pandemic uh, made it easier for many unions to embrace technology. I, you know, technology is best when it's just to put, you know, people together. 
Um, uh, but in addition to the various social media platforms that we are using to organize and reach out to workers, I think there's also um, one thing that's changing, and at least in our, uh, uh, it's it's uh, uh, embracing uh, different um, uh, uh, ways to communicate and reach out, um, you know, through text, um, uh, um, Facebook pages, and so on. Um, that's, I think, uh, 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 one of the, um, once again, I, th I think the pandemic forced everyone uh, from organizers that have been um, uh, accustomed to reach out to workers one-on-one, -on -one, um, you know, to, 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 to embrace, to embrace um, new technology. But with that being said, I, I, I do not think that technology will, it's the only, and should be the only way, it, um, uh, because uh, when you organize a union, it's fear is what holds people back from taking stand and fear is not going to be, um, you're not going to be, we're not going to be able to uh, push people to overcome their feel, their fear through a text. Um, so that's just another tool in, in the toolbox um, uh, that it's very effective when it's done correctly, right? So I'm going to take um, a broader approach to this question and um, just recognize that uh, words matter. So <laughs> I am so happy that I have yet to hear the term middle class foot on this campus. Uh, talking about the working class uh, gives us the ability to be much more inclusive, um, to work in solidarity. And uh, middle class goes right along with the old argument about industrial versus craft union, um, which is essentially um, all terminology and arguments that were around how can we make, give more power to the white working man. And so if we're going to form our new unions, they really have to be unions for all people. And we need to uh, define what work is. One of the biggest challenges here for Local 33 on this campus that I'm hearing is just recognizing that grad students are workers and acknowledging that. Uh, I'm <laughs> and uh, our, our union is a craft union, but guess what? It's a women-led union. And we actually had to break away from the pilots union and from the transport workers unions, the flight attendants on the whole, in order to build our own power and bring our issues to the table and have those heard and demand that those are heard and actually carve out our own space. And so it's really important that in every single way we're denying the union busters the ability to say that the unions are this bureaucratic organization that's something separate from the workers, but that the unions are actually the workers themselves and feel that with, within ourselves. In our workspace, we recognize that there's no way that we're gonna move forward on the issues that are important to flight attendants. Flight attendants are sick and tired of spending three quarters of our time at the bargaining table trying to hang on to the healthcare that we had yesterday. We're sick and tired of um, having to um, take care of each other after massive, uh, uh, disasters that destroy our homes, to destroy the infrastructure for us to even be able to go to work. We have to take on climate change. We're not going to do these things alone. So when we go throughout our um, workday, not only do we have workers on the plane who are consumers who are in our workspace, but as we walk through the airport, we have construction crews who hopefully and, and we would demand our union so that those construction jobs are being done properly in safe conditions because this is our workspace too. That the hotel van drivers and where we check in at the hotels um, and, the, and the hotel restaurants where we eat, that they are all represented by unions often unite here. Um, and uh, that the, uh, the other airport workers in the airport have what they need to be able to do one job and be able to do that job well, because we can't, we can't, our plane can't take off if we don't have the food from the catering kitchens that comes to our plane. And it also can't take off if the people who push the wheelchairs um, to bring people who needs a little assistance to our plane get there on time or get there on time to unload them. All of these things matter. And so as we go through our work life, um, what we're seeing more and more in building this worker solidarity and recognition of who is in a union 
it's women, it's immigrants, it's people of color. Who is doing the most valuable work in this country right now? I would argue that it is the people, is the immigrants who are fl flooding to areas where there has been uh, a massive disaster. And there has to be incredible cleanup, skilled cleanup work that goes on. And these workers oftentimes have no protection. Their work is devalued. Nobody wants to do that work. It's very hard work, but it's some of the most valuable work that could happen because the sooner that you can do that cleanup, the sooner that the city can restart, begin to collect taxes, start to operate again. It's billions and billions of dollars potentially in, in loss or in the ability to rebuild. And so when I think about how we're forming our new unions, we need to start thinking about who has been in charge and who has screwed it up and how can we get the cleanup crew to come in and take charge now? If, if I may add, I, I, I agree with you. And I, th I think economic uncertainty increases when we divide the labor force. Um, um, the the most um during the pandemic i think the poorest people the poor working families were forced to push the economy to keep the economy going while the more affluent families were talking about the blessings of the pandemic the ability to spend more time with their families and the ability to um, uh, uh, reinvent themselves. It was immigrants, dishwashers, housekeepers, nurses. It was the poorest, the poor working families that were put out there to keep the economy going. Um, I remember seeing signs about how heroes work here. Um, working, poor working families have no choice. You're a hero when you say, I will make a sacrifice because it's my choice. Poor people have no choice. They were forced to keep the economy going uh, while the most affluent families were reinventing themselves. Um, um, I, I agree, um, workers need to, immigrants, um, I, I'm from, um, and, and let me take time to talk a little bit about the uh, political climate in LA. Um, I am uh, from Oaxaca. I'm an immigrant from Mexico. Um, I um, worked two jobs to put myself to pay for a community college. Uh, my, my father passed away when he was three. My mother brought five children um, to this country 15 years after my father passed away. Um, she could not uh, continue my father's business in a male-dominated society, in a male-dominated industry. Um, in Oaxaca, um, my father spent time uh, um, making um, mezcal, uh, very male-dominated industry. Um, so she, we, we stayed in Mexico for 15 years until my mother knew that she could no longer afford, uh, or, or she didn't want to see her kids. She wanted her kids to have a better, better opportunities. Uh, brought us here. I was, you know, brought came here when I was 15 years old. I worked two jobs to put myself through community college. Um, and um, after seeing how hard my mom worked, she was a teacher back in Mexico before she got married. It came, um, uh, when I saw her, I saw her dignity vanish. She became just another uh, worker in America. Um, and I decided I didn't wanna do the same. I didn't wanna work uh, to make one person very wealthy. Um, I decided to organize a union. Um, and it was the most empowering experience working at LAX with a very diverse group of people from Ethiopia, um, uh, Persia, um, Asia. Um, uh, it was beautiful to see my coworkers and I um, um, organizing um, and winning. Um, and, and that was the most powerful experience um, that, that, that made me fall in love with this movement. And it was um, then when I decided this is what I want to do. Um, uh, uh, without, um, I think, um, many times through history, uh, uh, we blame immigrants for taking jobs. 
Um, but it is it, it is not always the case. I th it is true. There are some jobs that are very difficult and very low, uh, not well paid, um, that no one wants to take. And it's those immigrants that come and grab those jobs. But when we when we divide groups, uh, when we divide um, uh, 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 the various groups in the labor force is when we we all lose. Um, and I'll stop there. <laughs> well, I want to talk more about these kind of themes of division and unity. Um, you know, I think that one thing that we've been talking about for the last few minutes is the ways that um, organized labor has the potential to lead and to speak for and to mobilize and to represent and be, be of the people kind of beyond the line of particular bargaining units, particular locals, particular contracts and collective bargaining agreements. Uh, but that's an organizing challenge. Uh, and I think it's an organizing challenge that, um, you know, many of the kind of best and uh, most exciting organizing campaigns today are trying to figure out, but it's not a straightforward one. And there's a couple directions I kind of want to take this. One is a question of scale. Um, we talk often, and I think rightly, about the need to scale up workers organizing and union organizing very rapidly um, in the coming months and years. The number of people who uh, have the opportunity to actually, you know, have that first conversation with an organizer and think about or with a coworker and think about what would it mean to actually build something here in my community or in my workplace is way too small but by a massive fraction. Um, and so I'm curious about what you all think it would take to scale up in a different kind of way, where the resources for that might come from, what the strategies for that might look like. Uh, and then related to this also, I'm gonna jam another question in here. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, when labor scales up historically, sometimes it succeeds in uh, mobilizing, you know, millions behind it, even people who are not themselves necessarily you know, members of unions covered by bargaining agreements, uh, but sometimes also it faces backlash. Um, and I think in this moment, uh, you know, particularly with the politics of inflation and the possibility of disruption to the logistics system as one of our major points of leverage, right, in rail, in aviation, next year uh, in trucking and warehousing, and EBS, um, you know, we have a major opportunity to um, potentially scale up dramatically mm -hmm. and uh, how to figure out how to do that while bringing the people with us as opposed to letting uh, employers and uh, opponents mm -hmm. use inflation against the labor movement is something that I think would be worth kind of bringing into this discussion about, about scale and about unity and division. Um, well, on scale, I mean, I, I want to touch briefly on sectoral bargaining, because I think that's that's a hot topic. And, and you know, people have been talking about that as a potential reform. Um, you know, I think sectoral bar, I think it's clear that we need to move in the US away from what we have now, which is very low density, decentralized um, to a higher density, more centralized system. Um, and, you know, a huge problem with right now is that, and Joel Rogers has written about this, that, you know, in European countries where there's far higher density, they actually have very few collective bargaining agreements mm -hmm. because it's just a handful of agreements that cover the entire workforce or one agreement for an entire industry. We have far fewer union members, but we have like orders of magnitude, more CBAs, and each have different terms, they each have different expiration dates. And that in itself becomes a huge, not only administrative and resource burden for unions just to keep that going, but also it, it gets in the way of our coordination. And, you know, unions are become more powerful when we're able to bring more and more workers together. Um, you know, that's why unions are organized by industry or craft, right? Because you want to bring as many people together so that you can potentially shut that whole area down. Um, but the question is like how to get to that point. And um, you know, we've done sectoral bargaining in the US before uh, in certain industries, you know, say in auto and steel, we had you know, 30, 40% density and the unions were able to 
you know, leverage the fact that they could call a strike in all the major automakers um, and then set wages for the entire industry. We don't really do that very much anymore, except for in a few industries now. Um, but I think, you know, when we when people talk about sectoral bargaining, sort of looking to models in Europe, it's important to, I think, remember that they reached those systems. It was a compromise at the end of a period of very militant worker hacking. And that's what they achieved at the end of it. Um, I don't think, uh, you know, you can, you can get sort of workers to the table on equal footing um, or with any amount of leverage until you actually create that power first. And that's not to say that, uh, you know, policy change and law and, you know, policy innovations can't be a part of sort of greasing the wheels of organizing. Um, I don't think it's necessarily true that uh, this militant action, you know, it, it only goes in one direction. First, you have the action, then you have some labor law reform. I think it can be a, you know, back and forth thing. Um, I think sort of acknowledgement that labor law is right now a barrier to organizing is, I think, you know, recognizing the fact that if we maybe took those barriers away, that would help us organize. So, um, so yeah, so that's, that's on sectoral bargaining. I mean, on the, on the inflation piece, you know, I think it's really important that the labor movement has really strong spokespeople <laughs> at a minimum to, to frame these issues. Like, I, I think we're caught right now between, you know, there's this desire, there's this recognition that labor needs more power, but it's often couched in this, U.S. versus China rhetoric, <laughs> and the labor movement historically has not always been on the right side of that kind of protectionist and nationalist rhetoric. Um, so I think it's really important that we take a very strong stance against that. Um, and um, you know, while at the same time trying to take advantage of this moment with industrial policy and moving towards you know green jobs, like, I think the federal government. Can be a can be a really powerful tool in ensuring that all of these new industries that are created, all that investment leads to unionized workforces instead of just low wage workforces. Um, I want to say I think looking ahead, I I think it's it's uh, important. There's a uh, it is true that there's a surge in workers wanting to organize the union. Uh, planning ahead, I think, is how we're going to be able to maximize uh, uh, this potential. Um, lining up contracts to empower workers to strike. Um, in Los Angeles, the Olympics is, are coming in 2028. Um, we are now, we have now, um, over the past two years, have been able to line up all of our contracts for um, uh, to expire in 20, June 2023. There will be a vote. To, uh, we will strike to ask for another expiration right before the Olympics. Um, 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 not only to raise our standards uh, of benefits and pay, but to organize the non-organized. Um, so I think it's um, planning ahead Will, max, will will allow us to maximize that. The other, um, and just back to um, Charles' point, um, um, and, and, and yes, like I, I think the late, the way I think of a labor right as an immigrant from Mexico, um, um, corporations are global, uh, national corporations, um, and um, there's hotel owners, right across Mexico, uh, in Mexico, same owners here exploiting, um, exploiting people everywhere. Um, unless we, you know, I, I think when we, uh, when I think of uh, unions, when I think of labor, I think of uh, working families in the world that are struggling because there's a global economy um, uh, um, uh, that is, that you know that is profiting from beautiful communities throughout the world, and unless we uh, support workers everywhere, um, um, it's going to be tough, right, and challenging to 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 make real change. Uh, it's it's really this simple: an injury to one is an injury to all. 
And that is what the union has to, the union movement, the labor movement has to take into our hearts. Uh, that does not, uh, labor does not have borders. Uh, labor is exploited everywhere if labor is exploited anywhere. And so we have to really approach all of this with that, uh, with that very clear understanding and clear um, instruction to all labor to, to move this forward. In terms of scaling up, um, I, I just want to acknowledge that it is extraordinary that we're having this conversation at Yale uh, in this classroom, at, um, uh, in the uh, LPE project. And um, I want to actually thank everyone involved in putting this together. This has to happen a lot more. Um, I am living proof of solidarity. This is Mindy's scarf that I told her was beautiful last night, and she just took it off, off her neck. Um, it took the scarf right off her neck and gave it to the woman who loved it. Um, and so um, we... we <laughs> We have to scale up and have these conversations about workers being central to the economy, being central to the ideals of freedom, the ideals of democracy. We live in a system of unchecked capitalism where money is controlling more and more of our politics and we're not getting results through the political process because the people are not having their say because there's all kinds of ways to try to block the people from having a say. And the only way to change that is to put a check on capital. And the only way to do that is to build up unions. So anyone who cares about democracy, who actually cares about freedom, who actually cares about um, the uh, great exper experiment of the United States that has yet to realize its full potential, um, should contribute to programs that can help labor scale up should contribute in hundreds of millions of dollars to EWOC, for example. Um, we should be, <laughs> you're welcome, um, should, should, should be, um, we should be scaling up also because EWOC is um, providing the first and most important thing that's not happening out there, which is just simply a place for somebody to ask, how do I get started? But as you heard here, we have to support workers all the way through, how do I get started? How do I build that union that's our own democratic thing that we can own and we can control and we can define our issues and, and push forward and actually get a first contract as well. And um, so I, I think that there's a combination between bringing workers together and setting a national agenda that everyone can agree on. And uh, that national agenda, every time I go out and talk to workers, it doesn't matter who they are, if they're grad students or um, they are janitors or they are nurses or they're teachers or they're flight attendants or they're auto workers, the issues of two-tiered employment, um, not being able to hold your employer accountable, the ability to access sick leave, the ability to take vacation, the ability to enjoy your life, the ability to actually get a vacation, a, 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 get an education and not be uh, in debt for the rest of your life. Um, these are all, this is our national agenda. The, our national agenda is actually formed. All you have to do is listen, but you also have to keep people in the fight. So it's really important that unions are taking up those fights on a regular basis about what is actually happening in the workplace. What are the, what are the little issues also that people are identifying that they wanna change and taking action on that. So while you have the big, large national agenda, you can't forget that you've gotta keep it on the ground and real to the people who are actually creating the power to make the changes that we wanna see. Yeah, so I'll, I agree with all that. And I'll, I'll say a brief thing on inflation and then more on scaling up. On inflation, I think part of it also, just frankly, is uh, unions need to be better at challenging Democratic Party leaders. And, you know, there's a message right now that Democrats could be saying and generally aren't, which is corporations are responsible for you hurting right now. You are hurting and we're going to fight. And unions need to be able to push the Democrats more than they're willing currently. On the question of scaling up, I think we should acknowledge that labor has been on the defensive for a long time, and that is hard to break out of. And I, you know, with exceptions of people in this room, uh, you know, for the most part, the balance sheet of the last year hasn't been extremely um, encouraging as far as the ability to meet the moment. And we are in a moment right now where there's millions of workers who are looking to organize, right? And so the question is not just acknowledging that, because everyone says, you know, we need to increase density, but actually taking the necessary risks, because organizing is a risk, um, so that you can tell 
every worker in the country, if you start organizing at work, we are going to support you, right? So EWOC, this is a good idea, Sarah, you know, mentioned giving a lot of money, but actually AFL, CIO, and um, international unions should just be doing this on their own too. They don't need to give us money. You should just be saying, this is the number, this is the online link that any worker organizing uh, should fill out and we will get back to you. And here's a pitch for you uh, law students. And law, um, we need labor lawyers. We need a lot more labor lawyers. One of the major value added, good labor lawyers, uh, who, encourage people, <laughs> who encourage people to fight. Because one of the things that happens when you talk to workers who are organizing, one of the main kind of value added of unionization and EWOC and things like this is they need to know, they need to feel like they know what their legal rights are. And so we need uh, like an EWOC for labor lawyers where we can have a hundred really good labor lawyers who any work in the country can call up at any point point, be like, what do I do right now? Because right now we spend so much time just trying to like scramble to get the three good labor lawyers we know to give us support. Uh, and that would be a big boost for organizing. So hopefully that's one thing you all could do henceforth. Yeah, I, I, uh, I impersonated a labor lawyer in the new law campaign. I'm, in my capacity as a professor of labor studies, I, I gave some uh, legal advice to an employer. <laughs> um, well, I think on that note, we should turn to audience questions. Um, so I, I, are we able to take questions through the, uh, through the Zoom as well as in person, or are we do, just doing it in person? Okay, so I'll keep an eye on the Q&A on here. Um, and uh, it looks like there are mics around the room and also People can line up. I'm not quite sure what our protocol is. Okay. Um, okay. Well, well. Um, okay. I, I got. I got one. Well, so I wanted to follow up on uh, what Eric was saying. Sort of, what can students in the room do? So. Um, so one thing is, if folks are interested in working with EWOC, um, come find me afterwards, because I think one of the, when you get organizers together, they start talking about what they can do. And so we started talking last night about whether or not there might be ways for the Law and Political Economy Project to help connect students to, to organizing and things like that. So come find me. Um, but also, what else can students do as you're thinking about um, the really important work that you're setting out? What should we, what should we in the audience be thinking about doing? Can I can I take that? Oh, well, I want to before we leave, I want to send a shout out to my uh, many of my directors in the unit came out of Yale. Charles, thank you for your contribution uh, winning that election, Mr. C. Uh, Zoe, Zoe Tucker, uh, Juan Luna, you made Juan aware. Where's Juan? Had not been for Juan, we had a research project in Mexico. Man, thank you so much. You made that happen. Workers in Mexico, hotel workers in Mexico are being exploited. $8 per day across the border. Same companies, same owners um, in here, here in America. Thanks for that research project. Um, uh, workers are workers everywhere. Um, 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 I also want to, um, so my pitch for, for uh, labor lawyers are critical in law reform, in using the law in a strategic ways to create new policy that empowers workers and penalizes companies. It's not just come and give me the sense that I'm, I have rights. No, how do we use your knowledge to strategize on new policy? that empowers working families. Um, um, so, so there's tons to do. Um, we will be striking in LA, uh, 20, June 2023. If you're in LA, don't stay at a hotel where we all strike and hopefully we'll see you on the picket line. 2028, the Olympics are here. We gotta shut down LA. Um, so there's tons of work. Um, uh, to do in Unite Here and shout outs to Kurt Peterson, our co-president out of Yale. Um, and um, so what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> that answered the question, I think, right? Lots to do, think strategically, not just how do we enforce the current law, but how do we create new policy? Um, so things you could do. One is you could volunteer for EWOC. If you uh, you just go to workerorganizing.org, we need volunteers. But the main thing you should do is organize your workplace. So one of the exciting things is um, there is a wave of unionization in higher ed. 
and so some of this has already happened at Yale, but for those of you uh, out there watching as well, uh, student workers are organizing, not just graduate student workers, but one of the, this is a relatively new phenomenon, Grinnell uh, started it, but it's really spread where dining hall workers and just any worker uh, who's a student or not is unionizing. And so that's something for undergrads can do, like go for it and you, you will uh, get support because one of the important things about organizing is also just you learn best through doing it. And so I'm very, I, I, when I feel bleak about the world, I try to think about all of the 18, 19 year olds right now who are really uh, eager to make change and who are unionizing and who are in turn then going to unionize for the rest of their life. And I've interviewed them and they just say, well, you know, I organized my student union at my college and then I'm going to organize uh, my next job. And so to me, I would encourage you all to do that as well. I want to encourage uh, more um, lawyers of color to become labor lawyers. Um, you know, I, I think every year it gets a little better and, you know, we're setting up different structures. The AFL-CIO has, you know, caucuses uh, for lawyers of color. Um, you know, they're even within unions, like within my union, SEIU, uh, there's caucuses for, you know, different sort of affinity groups in there that are doing really important work. Um, I think the labor law bar has, you know, generally historically been seen and perceived as very white and male dominated. Um, and that is an issue. And, you know, and, it, and that in itself becomes a barrier to women and people of color, like feeling like they are welcome in the movement. Um, so I just want to say, I, I think, you know, if you care about racial justice, if you care about gender justice, the labor movement is one of the most important places you can be. Um, because it's a place where you are improving the lives of workers of color, women workers, immigrant workers. And not only that, you know, unions are one of the few places in American society where you have all sorts of people coming together. You know, I, you just don't really see that in much, many other places. And like we live in a very segregated society, but at work, it's one of the few places where people are actually coming together. And if you are a lawyer of color coming in that space, it does make a difference. It does mean something. So that, that would be my, uh, my encouragement. Yeah, um, we talked about this in the previous question, but um, all uh, labor work and all efforts to try to create reform is power-based. And um, there is there has been an effort to keep workers in competition with each other. Um, I, in organizing spaces, uh, what organizers will do is try to um, identify the different demographics, find leaders in each of those demographics so that we can have reach there and have people who um, can talk with coworkers that they trust and know and, and can identify with. Um, if you think about that in reverse, uh, the, the fact that the labor movement um, and any policymakers in this country utterly failed women um, on achieving equal rights in this country, and now that we um, are facing uh, this Dobbs decision and uh, the continued attack to try to take away all of women's freedom, um, that is a direct attack on labor everywhere. And so one of the things that I think is really, really important if we're going to be successful and recognize what labor is about is that um, social issues are not separate from economic issues. They're directly tied. And in my workplace, this is, this is you know, extremely evident. There are flight attendants who are taking off in one state with certain rights and landing in another state with different rights in the middle of their work day. And uh, when I t um, interviewed a, uh, a flight attendant who was an original member of our union, um, it was shortly after I first started flying, I was sort of in awe of her. She had been flying for over 60 years. Um, and I, I asked her about her career. And one of the things that she was famous for doing was being uh, forming our first safety committee flying around the world, talking to governments and talking to manufacturers and airlines and um, having uh, evacuation standards, equipment on the aircraft that was standardized uh, throughout the world. She, was, she, she conceived of this herself, used the power of her union to have the space to do that um, and actually achieve that. And I wanted to hear um, all about that and what she uh, kept wanting to talk to me about that I didn't really understand because I was born in 1973. 
was that the lion's share of her union work that had never been talked about, never been seen, was that in order for the people that she represented to be able to keep their jobs, she had to help them find uh, the ability to get an illegal abortion or to get health care after an abortion had been botched. Um, she kept wanting to talk to me about this. And uh, I thought it was sort of a fascinating point historically, but it didn't hit me uh, the way that it probably should have until this summer. And um, right now, um, if we don't understand that we have to urgently organize around these social issues so that there can be any kind of ability to create any kind of economic equality or fairness, um, then, then we are going to lose. And we have to understand that urgently fighting for women's rights and women's freedom and, and bodily autonomy is central to building up our unions and building the kind of world that we're trying to talk about here, all of us here on this panel. Um, so I would just ask everyone to keep that point for and do everything that you can to lock in uh, freedom for women. It puts me in mind the uh, role of brotherhood of sleeping car porters in the uh, early 20s, or especially in the um, 20s, who were able to distribute uh, black newspapers in the Jim Crow South because of the distinctive role that they had in, on, on the rails. Um, and in that way, in the center of the black freedom movement, what you're describing is like, it's kind of a good parallel. Okay, uh, the next question I want to ask comes from the audience about uh, this myth of the law that we were talking about earlier. Um, is there a way to mobilize the myth of the law, meaning uh, the way that the law can mean something for workers even beyond its kind of enforceable letter? Uh, is there a way to mobilize this myth of the law with communities and workers explicitly excluded from labor law protections, like undocumented people, farm workers, domestic workers, some public sector work workers, independent contractors, and so on, given especially congressional inaction? What are paths forward for organizing these workers, and how do we limit the risks to their well-being when they organize? Well, I think first and foremost, it's really important to help people understand the history of the law, um, because the law didn't just sort of come to be; it wasn't handed down. Um, on um, uh, it, it came to be because people protested, because people uh, wanted to see a different kind of world. And so it's really important for people to understand that, that um, just because uh, uh, the law may say one thing today doesn't need, mean that it needs to say the next thing tomorrow. It can, you can actually make improvements and um, expand, uh, expand the principles of a free society uh, in the law um, if you take action. So I think that's fundamental. I'll, I'll let the rest of my panel get to this. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's tough, and I think it's part of why Lorena was saying we need labor lawyers coming up with you know policy changes. But it, it is possible. I mean, look at uh, California, right? The governor there just signed a law giving, expanding the rights actually of farm workers who have historically been excluded from labor law, right? Expanding their right to union. And it, and it took a lot. He didn't. He didn't want to sign it, right? It took. It took a ton of organizing. It took Biden, you know, putting out a press release saying he should sign it. Um, so it's not easy. Um, but you know, I I think also, uh, you know, labor law. It it's not like the restrictions that it places on workers to organize. I think it's important to make sure people understand like it's not it's it's not it's not a moral kind of law right it's not a law it's not a law so like it's wrong for you to organize right these are laws that the entire point of it is to set the rules of what workers can do in their struggle um you know for dignity and better working conditions and wages and so you know it's i i think there's no reason to sort of fetishize like taking action to break the law, but at the same time, there's also no reason to, you know, no reason to sort of give these laws any more power than they should have, right? Really, what it is, is it's a set of rules and there are certain possible consequences if you don't do them, you know, whatever financial liability, but I think 
you know, we should we should look at those objectively and and not um, as some kind of like having some greater force than they do. Yeah, I I mean my, my experience organizing since the pandemic started has underscored just the extent of the fear factors across the board for any workers. But if you don't have papers, if you're undocumented, it's just so much higher. And so we, should, we just need to acknowledge that, that one of the biggest labor law reforms that could happen would just be legalizing everybody in the US, which is a demand that needs to happen. And I mean, if you want, I, I, if you, there's a lot of horror stories during the pandemic, but I have a hard time thinking of an industry that's been worse than meatpacking and we've, I've supported some drive in that. And just the conditions that people have been in, what you, the way you frame it is right, forced to endure is beyond my ability to describe. And the fact that, that you haven't had more organizing out of that can basically be attributed to fear factor. And so unless uh, national politicians are able to put back on the agenda and the movement put back on the agenda that no human being is illegal. I have a hard time seeing how just on our own, we're gonna be able to overcome that fear factor at scale. Um, I agree. And um, one of the beautiful things about the labor movement, right? It's coalition building. Uh, with that coalition building, uh, uh, um, it's very difficult. Um, uh, uh, ballot initiatives, and I go back to these, idea of like using your knowledge, your expertise to create local policy that over time will make national change. Um, uh, I, you know, 2013, I think living wages were in population before Seattle. We passed it in Long Beach uh, and, and it spread um, and wages, you know, um, are increasing. Uh, but um, uh, so, um, We've effectively been able to uh, use um, the law to, well, to use to, to create new laws. Like uh, it's uh, being um, uh, being at, at the uh, complacent or just taking the status quo and enforcing it and waiting, waiting for something to change. It's gonna. It's, it's never gonna change. You all need to be part of that change. Um, it starts with local. In 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 my in my experience, right? It starts locally. Um, uh, ballot initiatives, um, local ordinance um, that give working families power to make real change. Um, it's. I think. Um, a way to think about uh, about it. Um, we have a few more questions. When do we have to stop? I realize I forgot. Uh, One thirty. Okay, so um, I'm going to combine a couple, and then maybe we can go to you. Um, but let's get them maybe all on the table, and then both can answer them as, as you want. So we have a couple questions about um, sort of upcoming uh, either judicial or legislative fights, issues, possibilities. One about the forthcoming Supreme Court case, Glacier Northwest versus uh, International Brotherhood of Teamsters. I'd say I don't know what that is, but the team uh, kind of us. And uh, what, what the implications of that might be. It seems like a good question for this room. Um, and we also have a question online about the concrete and realistic possibilities of continuing and renewing the push for the PRO Act and what we actually need to do to make that viable. Um, let's say, I guess let's do those two and then we'll go to you. Um, I'm getting it right. I think the Glacier Northwest case is the one about liability for going on strike. Is that the one? Yeah. So, um, you know, if you don't know, I mean, the basic facts are that um, the union, you know, had a strike. It, it, it's like a cement trucking company. So, you know, the trucks where the cement thing is like spinning around and keep it from solidifying. So they planned a strike. Uh, they went on strike. The, the, the truckers went on strike. They even told the truckers to leave the trucks on so the thing would keep spinning so the concrete wouldn't harden quickly. Um, but, you know, it was a strike. They stopped working and eventually the concrete did harden. And uh, that was an economic loss for the company. And so the company sued the union and said, you owe us for the amount of damages or the lost value of the concrete. Um, that's a huge problem. Uh, the Supreme Court granted cert, that's a really bad sign 
because the whole point of going on strike is that it's an economic weapon. That's that's the point, right? So if unions are going to be held liable for damages caused during a strike, uh, then you're really starting to abrogate the right to strike even more than it already is. I mean, we'll see how bad the decision is, right? It could be more limited to, let's say, you know, maybe they say, oh, you need to give the employer more notice or something like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, um, it's just, it's a matter of how bad it is, right? And, you know, I mean, I talked to some other labor lawyers who, at this point, they're even just thinking, you know, beyond all the court reform stuff, why are we even participating in this case, right? What, what if what if the labor lawyers just got together and said, you know what, we're not even going to participate in the arguments for this because this is the, the, we're not going to get our fair hearing in Supreme Court. Everyone knows it. Um, so why are we even engaging in this process? I don't know if we're ready to go that far, but I think those types of things need to be put out there because that's the reality of this Supreme Court right now. It's not just the Supreme Court. <laughs> So uh, the mine workers been on strike for 18 months in Alabama. Um, they filed um, ELP charges against the company. They had five of their members and their spouses hit on the picket line as peaceful picketers. Um, there have never been charges for those um, vehicle uh, ve vehicular strikes um, against the company um, or any of their agents. Um, and the company filed ELP charges against the strikers who you can imagine um, got a little mad that their friends and their spouses and coworkers were being hit and no one was holding the company accountable for that. Um, and also mad that uh, the company was getting rulings from the court that said that they couldn't be within 900 feet of any entrance to the mine. Well, you're out in the woods if you get 900 feet from there. How does anybody even know that there's a strike going on? Um, there, there have been uh, zero efforts to try to uphold the rights of those miners in that strike. And the NLRB uh, came out with a decision after having a hearing between the company and the union about some damages from, um, you know, some strikers who may have like smashed a light or something like that. And there was a discussion about the union paying for the damage to the company property that happened during the course of the strike. But the company gave a list to the NLRB that included the loss of production um, as, as part of um, the charges that should go against the union. And the initial bill that came from the NLRB region 10 was for $13 million, which was um, what the company had listed as the loss of production costs for the, for the strike. So if that had stayed in place under the most union friendly president that um, our country has ever seen, um, we, we would have seen a total destruction of the right to strike. Now, there was a tremendous amount of effort by a lot of us to try to put pressure to say that the NLRB, that uh, National needed to override that decision by Region 10. That actually did get reversed. It took a lot of internal effort, a lot of pressure. Um, so this is not a new idea at the Supreme Court, which is why I, I don't have a lot of hopes for a narrow uh, uh, decision there that might not be as bad. Um, I think it's a, it's a real threat. We have to understand it as a real threat. And, and the only way that we get any outcome that's going to be favorable to workers is if we rise up and make this a serious issue um, and talk about how uh, disastrous this is and also and also help people understand people have not talked about the strike for a long time they haven't talked about collective bargaining for a long time collective bargaining only works when you have the right to strike at the end of it because there is a deadline and there is a consequence for both parties and that encourages people to come to solutions that they otherwise wouldn't collective bargaining is not about everybody getting everything that they want it is about solving problems and it is about people coming together and reasonably solving those problems. And so sometimes you have to have um, something uh, something that's a really, really tough choice for everyone in order to do that. And a strike is a tough choice for a worker to go down on strike, and it's a tough choice for a company to take that strike. And so that strike encourages collective bargaining, encourages problem solving. We need to celebrate the strike in that way, not just as worker power, but as the idea that we can actually solve problems when we come together and talk about them. Yeah, I'll, I'll just say what it would take to pass the PRO Act. So we desperately need the PRO Act. The PRO Act is great. Uh, the theory of change that has been pushed to get there is inadequate. 
this to get the product passed would require such a level of changing the relationships of forces between owners and workers that we need to basically be able to make this a national scandal that millions of people feel like labor reform is necessary for their lives, for their families to be able to get by. And so what that looks like right now is union leaders with the resources making a huge political scandal out of the union busting that's happening. To keep it in the front page news, we should have union leaders getting arrested at the White House, arrested in Cong Congress. Um, you know, this is the level of urgency that's necessary, because if you're able to then make it not an abstract wonky thing, which is the way it's normally framed, that most people really can't make heads or tails of, but is we need to stop Howard Schultz from literally ruining the lives of thousands of workers right now against the law. That's the thing that can capture people's narrative. It needs to be something at the scale of the civil rights movement in the 60s, where people understand this to be a moral, urgent question. And unless we're able to seize the moments which are fleeting, in which workers are looking to do that, I don't think you're going to pass PROAC. Do you want to really quick ask your question and we can do like a one minute response? <laughs> yeah, uh, on the on its face, the, poly, the mantra that was expressed that labor, uh, uh, injustice to labor anywhere is injustice to all labor, um, mm -hmm. seems uh, like it could be um, counter to uh, sensible climate policy, especially when it comes to ending uh, coal extraction in this co country because labor is hurt. So how does the labor movement uh, square with uh, necessary climate policy in this? So um, what we have to recognize is that um, if, you're, if you're pitting someone's job against a, um, a good policy, um, you, they're never going to agree with you. Um, so, but if we're honest about what we need to do uh, um, in order to tackle climate change, then we also have to be honest about what we do, have to do to take care of the people to transition them to a different economy. And um, the only experience, for example, that the um, miners have had uh, in, in environmental policy is that it has been used as a mean to shut down mines in one state that were union and, and transfer it to another state that are non-union um, and destroy those jobs and destroy those communities and destroy the tax base, destroy education, everything that comes with it, destroy those communities. Um, so we, we, we need to be honest about the history of environmentalism and that it's actually unions and union members who were the first to uh, tackle the issues of um, of spoiling the environment it was actually the miners who were on the front lines of that, um, taking on the coal companies, spoiling the water that their uh, families were drinking in the in the coal towns. Um, and the air that was being spoiled is the steel workers that were at the front of a lot of the environmental policy that uh, and discussion that has is in place today. So we have to break down the the, the myths uh, that uh, good policy around the climate means that it has to be at odds with people's jobs. We can actually create, um, my union was the first to endorse the Green New Deal. And a lot of people asked us, why did flight attendants endorse the Green New Deal? And I said, because we read it. And it does, it, it envisions creating a different economy that we would all like to see. And this is a moment of crisis that we can use to actually reshape the way that we imagine that we live with one another and, and the kinds of um, protections that we need to have in order to take care of ourselves and our families. And so I, um, I challenge anyone who uh, challenges the mine workers on the, on the positions that they've taken. And actually I've challenged the mine workers to put out demands for what they need in order to support climate policy, and they have done that. So if you look back and you look at um, over the past two years, the mine workers actually took a, a ton of uh, flack from their members who were being uh, told that this was just anti-Trump or <laughs> whatever. Um, and they actually put forward a plan um, for a real just transition and actually you know, went on the demand side rather than on the heels dug in side of talking about how we create something better and how we solve problems. Okay, That's the, right. Sorry. Just the uh, uh, global warming is a reality. The environmental crisis we're living, it's a reality that affects everyone. Um, and if we don't unite to, 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 to control, um, um, it, it, this is an issue that affects everyone. Um, and if we think about it, it's those corporations that are making vast damage 
in our environment and no one makes them accountable. We partnered with, with environmentalists to fight the companies that once again exploit beautiful geographies for profit, exploit humans for profit. This is a, an issue that needs to be tackled by all um, and has been. Okay, on that note, I think we need to stop. Um, thank you to our panelists again for a fascinating discussion and uh, really bringing the spirit of militancy here to Yale Law School. Uh, and thanks to LPE and to the organizers of this event for uh, a great couple of days. And shout out to uh, grad students organizing. Please, yes, we can. <laughs>